the next uh, pa panelist that I want to introduce to you is Panabet uh, Kritbet. Sorry for if I'm wrong with the name pronunciation. Uh, she's a very interesting person. She holds a master's degree in music education as well as in economics and finance and has actually in her career worked in both fields, which is uh, very rare and um, it's think very exciting combination and she's currently uh, owner and manager of a couple of music schools in Thailand and she will share now with us uh, the lessons she's learned during the lockdown and the ways of everything moving online. Uh, welcome Banabat, we're looking forward to your presentation. Hello everyone, um, thank you for inviting me to sharing the paper here. So first of all I would like to introduce myself to you as um, Chris said before, I have a background in economics and finance and I am also doing a graduate degree at Chulalongkorn University in music education. And apart from that, I am the owner of two music schools in Bangkok um, named KPN. So I actually had an impact from COVID-19 lockdown in early of this year. So we had to shift all the, all, all the lessons to online platform. And that's what I'm going to share about what we have done and lesson learned today. So let me share the screen um, of my presentation. Okay, so you can all see now. Okay, great. So um, today I'm going to cover three main topics. The first one, uh, I'll tell you the story of what happened to our schools from the lockdown. And secondly, I'll tell you what we have done in an online class during that time. Well, maybe different from maths because we never prepared for an online lessons before. So it's actually an, an unexpected situation that we faced. And lastly, um, I'll tell you the lessons learned from COVID-19 lockdowns and some tips can actually be adapted and used in uh, nowadays traditional face-to-face -face lessons too. So, let me introduce my school first. My school is actually a private music school in Bangkok. It's a non-formal school. So it means that students will only come during weekends and weekdays after school class. And we teach uh, a wide range of music instruments. Um, also voice class, singing class, ballet and dance as well. And our target students are uh, children aged from four years old to 12 years old. Well, we accept older students as well, but mainly they're all children. Okay, and from what happened from COVID-19, we all knew that the COVID-19 spread actually started since December 2019. But in early of 2020, the government, the spread has become um, Worse. So the government announced the school shutdown on 18th of March. So this is very unexpected for us as the school that we operate um, normally, and we only knew it. We only knew short notice, short notice because the announcement came on 17th of March. So on the next day, we had to close the school, and it would last for three and a half months because at the time the Ministry of Education said that the school could reopen again on the 1st of July. So three months, very, very long period. And it's quite challenging to us because we are still learning school and we normally do in person because it's music learning and we also have some group activities like ensemble and duet parts, those things. So um, it's quite challenging. And after the school shut down later on, it comes up with, it came with the Bangkok City lockdown. So everyone, not just students, but parents, they had to stay at home. And all schools shift their lessons into online class. So now our students not facing only music online lessons, but math, um, Thai, English, everything will be online. So we had to deal with that too. So the question is, how should we conduct the school's music activities and lessons online during that time in the context of lockdown and stay home? So 
first thing that I did, I actually had a meeting among teachers, parents, students, related parties, like school staffs online to help and to discuss what were we going to do. So we kind of relied on design thinking process to like use the, the process to try to find a solution uh, that is best for the time. So we emphasize the customer's need. So we know that parents and students, well, definitely, they want to continue music lessons. They want to uh, continue the music activities, but they have limited digital knowledge. So not all parents, they can like go online, they do the Zoom, not, not everyone can do the Skype. Some students, they live with their grandparents. So it's really hard to get on the device. So we define the needs. It has to be easy, inexpensive for them, and flexible time because, as I said before, that all subjects were shifted to online. So we had to still the students get. We have to fight for the students' schedule with other subjects as well. Then we, I had the idea to find a solution. Um, so at the time, we think okay. We need to utilize the free online applications and the platform that we we are using nowadays, like live chat, um, Facebook Messenger, or I, any other social media, YouTube, because it's the plat it's uh, tools that everyone is familiar with. Then we prototype, we test it, and we um, develop, and then we adjust, and we we we, we test and we developed it yeah so i'll tell you the story what we've done firstly we did the traditional online lessons well because we are inexperienced person to be to do the online so what we did was just um put two cameras one for teacher and one for student doing the lessons in long distance well the limitation is exactly what Matt says before that Okay, with the internet speed, with the synchronization and many things. Um, so some part for those students who cannot afford the live session, we also allow the messenger to be the channel of communication among between teachers and students. So like teacher can send the message of guideline, video clips to show how to do the how to work on some pieces. Students can do self-learning and then they can practice and send back the video to get the feedback. And that um, way can be done on social media as well. However, yes, as I said, that for an inexperienced people like us, we face the limitations. First thing is instruments. Okay. Not all students have instruments at home or sometimes instruments are not in a proper environment like you know in the middle of living room with grandparents with um, every other things. Secondly, the video quality uh, when we do the live session um, because it requires high quality recording device and not every family can afford that. Third is environment. So their stay at home, it's not a study room, exactly. So it, it's quite hard to conduct the lessons online. And sometimes what we found is that um, when we did the online lesson, we, we had other family members in the family sitting there and watching the teacher teaching as well. Well, so it's not really a private lesson, it's like one too many lessons. So it, it's kind of a new experience too. Okay, fourth thing is um, nonverbal expressions. Yeah, we, we can hardly detect if the students can understand, if they get tired, if they feel bored about the lessons. So um, that is the things that we have to be aware of. And lastly, internet speed. Yeah, so in Thailand, we have 3G, 4G, Wi-Fi, but it's not enough for the live session, especially for music lessons where Sometimes we require the playing at once. So um, we came up with a new online platform in early of in, in in late of May, early of June. So like a month last month actually. 
So we created a Facebook private group called Learn at Home by Katie and Jazz. So in this group, we kind of mix many methods together and gather all the students, teachers, and school staff as a small community, and then we share the contents together. And let's learn the things that we found is that these social interactions is actually very beneficial because it motivates our students. Uh, it's fun and creating player environment. And we also put a weekly challenge into the group as well. So the students has more activities rather than just doing the homework and come back to their teacher. And secondly, instead of doing the private live session, right, we create a school teaching videos. So the school support teachers to record high quality teaching video to use across many lessons, um, especially those basic contents like scales, theories, or some popular songs like Twinkle Little Stars for our young students. And we found that using the videos actually financially reduce costs for us because one video can be used um, repeatedly to many students and it actually aligned with the school policy that it instructionally standardized the teaching methods and materials. So it benefits for us as a school quite a few. So this is an example of the teaching video. I'll show you. This is the scale. Mm -hmm. So yeah. So basically, this is the video we made. Yes. We show left hand, right hand, and we posted this video on Facebook. Okay. Um. Okay. So, after they watch the video. The students can do their self-learning from the video and then they can apply for a private session to talk to the teacher. Uh, we found this very beneficial as it develops students' responsibility because they have to do the homework before coming to the class by learning by themselves. And we found that in this private section actually reduce time. It requires less time for each student. So like each traditional class is one hour in an online private lesson, it may take only 30 minutes to cover all the materials and teachers can go right to the customized detail for each student. So the private sections could be in any form like Zoom video call between two or Facebook Messenger like they record high quality video posted and then get feedback or some parents um, who would like who like to share? They post a kids video in Facebook group post to get uh, feedback, and these feedbacks definitely can be shared to other students too. Okay, uh, in Learn at Home by Katie in Jazz, we also use uh, digital tools to support the learning as well. So this came from the idea that in the traditional lesson, we usually play duet with the students. So for example, in piano lesson, the teacher will stay on the left side of the piano playing a company to the student and student play on the right side, right? But it's quite difficult to do in Zoom session because of the internet speed and sound synchronization problem. So the teacher actually created a backing track and give to students to practice and to play along. And we can use various instruments um, for this too. And we can share uh, backing tracks for many teachers. So this actually improves ear training in students and in encourage assess aesthetic experience and creativity. Um, so it's actually fun. I'll show you the example. Listen and sing number two. Okay, you will play the do re mi melody while your teacher is playing the music. Let's go. Yeah, so this is the sample of the 
uh, video with the sound uh, for piano for kids lesson. And this one actually uh, came up with the playing guideline for our parents that is the video on the left side that you see. And this is posted in Facebook private group as well. Listen. Oh, sorry. <laughs> so, um, finally, um, out of the videos that we created by ourselves, we also introduced our students' music applications for them to practice at home too. So, I won't really go into the specific applications because we only try and tested some applications, but we found this application is quite useful because it can help students practice more effectively. It's fun, enjoyable, and some applications come with the game-based um, game features. And the program can provide immediate feedback to the students. So let me show you the example of one application that I actually use for myself uh, during COVID-19. So this is using uh, the application to teach how to play guitar. It started from guitar tuner and you only need iPad, iPhone and a guitar, um, just an acoustic one. You don't need to plug into the computer, but it can detect the sound and it can detect the, if you play correctly, if you play the right pitch. And it's kind of the game form. You can gain points, you can go up to the next level so it's actually very interesting well i don't get any commission to show this app but i think it's interesting so maybe you guys can um have a look around it's it's not expensive to to, to purchase it too um so this is a example yeah so when you play the program we actually feedback your student if you get it right perfectly or not yeah. okay and you can also adjust the speed you can also um, repeat it um, to practice too so this is the things that you can also introduce to your student and maybe use for yourself so um here are keys takeaway that i'm going to summarize here about the lesson learned from COVID-19 lockdown. First thing, some teaching ideas that we came up during the online lesson can actually be used in face-to-face -face class. For example, like um, various backing tracks, the self-learning before class, or uh, um, any other ideas, the recording of the video of the students playing so they can also look, up, look at their performance and to repeat, redo it too. Um, secondly, teachers should use various teaching methods. So this is like a wake up to us as the teachers, um, instead of sitting in a class face to face in person, doing the same method, teaching methods, we can now adapt and use other tools to, to do teaching in a different way to make it more creative too. And third, the use of digital tools actually enhance learning activities. So it comes up to um, the program, the, uh, the applications that we can um, apply in our class too. And lastly, um, learning community actually supports students' motivation. So nowadays we still keep our Facebook group on. We also create a fan page for our school and then we also have weekly challenge, sometimes monthly challenge, to make the students interact with each other to join the activities. So that's what all that I want to share today. So thank you. Thank you very much. A lot of great ideas. Um, mm -hmm. Very, very interesting presentation. I. Let's see whether there are some questions are coming in. We have time for them now. I want to start with one question that uh, I find very interesting. So do you think for you now that part of teaching online is here to stay with your music school? Yeah, I think um, it can be partly done because it's beneficial. Like uh, when we do in homework or the revision 
session, we can do the online class because we already go into details in private, face to face already. So the students don't have to come into the school. It can reduce cost, traveling time. So we, we still keep some online class. And we, we, all, we all know that the travel time in Bangkok can be horrendous. Yeah, uh, yeah it's horrible here. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, that leads into another question. The normal economic model of, of, a, of a music teacher was the student comes, you prepare the class and you get paid for your time that you're teaching the student. Um, now with creating online content, reviewing videos that the students sent uh, and also uh, also then uh, spending time very jagged for, for that. How do you account for that so that the teacher gets actually paid a fair, fair amount or is this all extra work that is now uh, not paid and is only paid for the face-to-face -face online classes? Ah, we actually divided the payment into parts. Like the teachers who come and create a standardized video, they get paid for making that video. Um, that is one off actually and then when do when they do the online private sessions like 30 minute sessions they get paid for that and you can see that, uh, that it's um, actually reduced traveling time they can accept more students and they can um, go into details with each students and the revision uh, part I think that's accountability of the teacher so um, that's what part of the job well, normally the revision is done in during class, right? So that is normally part of the teaching time mm -hmm. where the student plays and now it's suppo it's outsourced out of that sometimes. So do you see a problem with that? Um, not really. <laughs> not, not currently because um, if the, the revision time, maybe it took only about 15 minutes, um, not more than that. So, so it's not really... Wow, I'm just saying, of a 45 minutes lesson, that is already uh, <laughs> a, a third of the time. Mm. Yeah. To reviewing the video and then get the yes. feedback. Yeah. Mm -hmm. mm. Uh, uh, I see Max has a question that he wants to, to ask. Please, Max, just unmute yes. yourself. Very yeah. quick, because it's actually connected to what you mentioned. Uh, here in Malaysia, there were problems that uh, for private music schools, but even private universities where parents ask for a discount saying online lessons are not as useful as the regular classroom face-to-face -face lessons. Were there any complaints to that in your school? And if yes, how did you respond to that? Okay, so at first I'll tell you that during COVID-19, we, we started for free. Uh, at the time, the school support uh, teachers for the, um, for, the, for the revenue for them. But the parents, they don't have to pay. But later on, then we um, gave them the discount for online class. Well, it's quite difficult to talk to them because they still believe that they still prefer that the in-person class is more beneficial, more useful than uh, face to that online lessons. And also because in online lessons, it's not just the teacher, but also the students. They feel that they have to work harder and like they have to do self-learning, they have to doing the video recording things. And sometimes parents have to help their children too. So it's more work for them. Instead of sending the children to private music school, the parents can do something else. But now the parents has to have to come sitting there and help the, the children. So the price for online lessons for me has to be a little um, less expensive than the normal uh, in person lessons. But, but, but that means also you would teach your teacher, you would pay your teachers less. No, no, I'll pay teachers ah. the same because even though they don't have to travel, but they have to prepare more, exactly. a lot yeah. more. And yes, review students' videos. So for uh, as an owner, I have to balance both. Um, I have to pay teachers the same, but reduce the uh, cost fee for the parents. And you can also, and you can also, if, if you have a mixed uh, uh, program, I guess you can also uh, save on, on, on rental of, of the actual unit space that you are having, right? Yeah, exactly. And it reduces cost because we can use, as I said, one video. So it's like one hour of teacher to apply to many students. So that's uh, economies of scale. Like we can um, save costs by doing that. 
There are still a lot of, uh, of, of questions that I have, and I guess some, some of our panelists as well, and I'm looking forward to discussing them at the end. But for now, we, I thank you and we move on. Uh, the next panelist that is here is Dr. Pamon Pan, Kamol Pamon, sorry. Um, she is Director of Orchestras and Instructing, Instructor for Conducting at Bahidon University in, uh, in Thailand. And she's normally used to travel the entire world to, as a conductor and uh, pedagogue. And she will share with us now her innovative ideas and strategies she developed to teach conducting online. Please welcome. Okay, thank you. Let me open my uh, presentation first. Okay, hi everyone. So good afternoon. I'm so grateful for, to Bryn Skalayani Watana for providing me an opportunity to share, discuss ideas resources and two for the teaching of conducting online today. Um, today presentations, I will discuss possible models for a post COVID-19 education in conducting, including best practices and innovative solutions. Due to the COVID-19 recovery plans of many inst uh, institutions, including Mahidon University, are uh, implementing protective measures against the spread of COVID-19 by continuing to offer classes online. But how, how we can, uh, how conducting class be taught online? So this question is came to um, me right at that moment because um, the conducting class they require for, you know, react from the ensemble. Um, beside of conducting technique that be taught in the class, understanding of the role to, of, um, to be a conductor, to lead, react, alter, and reinforce the performance of the ensemble. Without conducting um, the real ensemble, it causes a lack of training for competent musicianship by um, a reaction from ensemble, able to um, read the ensemble and, and also the lack of um, uh, improvement skills of the readership, the lack of providing um, comment from players. In the past for in person, um, for the conduct in the, my conducting class, we always have a react between conductors and players in the class at all times. Okay, let, let's overview about today's discussion topics. Our first one, I'll, I'll talk about general information of my classes, the two advantages and disadvantages of online um, conducting class, private conducting class online um, between in-person and online. Let me start with general information. There are, there are three conducting courses that I'm teaching at Mahidon University. For the first one, um, undergrad, instrumental, ba uh, instrumental basic conducting. Is this a required course for the third year student, uh, which is required for two courses for their curriculum? Uh, for these semesters, there are 20 students and some of them are stay outside of the Thailand in China and Korea. So this is a mix um, of students here. Second, um, private conducting for graduate student major, which is um, teaching on right, right now because he live in Chiang Mai, other part of the uh, um, country. Last, minor private conducting, which is teaching in person. So next. So I, I asked, I asked my friend around who are teaching conducting online in the US right now that they just start and they, they so that's why I, I kind of, you know, um, collect all these ideas for the possibility today also. Mahidon University starts the semester in July, which is one of the first music schools starting classes after the COVID-19 outbreak. Um, it depends on many factors, policy, 
um, environment, money, etc. So trust, the possibility to conduct the class are 100% online, 100% in person, but not right now. And 100% in person, separate groups, mix of 50% uh, online and 50% offline with the whole group and separate group. So uh, due to our factors, especially for government policy for Mahidol University, we did 100% online for phase one, which is last month that are that, that we did the 100% online. But for now, we we on phase two, which, which is 100% in person for resident, but online learning for international students. So let me share how I provide the classes. Following my conducting classes objective in the topic of conducting technique for, um, for in-person, they do conducting with ensemble separate into three groups. They are required to play in the class ensemble while their friends come to conduct uh, that ensemble. Submitting video of conducting with their singing and act excerpt. However, for online class, they do only just submitting video, of course, we, we, we don't have a chance to, you know, um, do that for the whole ensemble. Um, the, next, the next one, the next topic, performance reflection. Yeah. Performance reflections. Um, instructor comment during their conducting, and then I think that is very effective while write a video uh, reflection that submit video for online learning and they are required to write a video reflection too. So almost the same, but the lack of that is I can, con I can comment them right away and very effective and right at the moment and time consuming, I think for, you know, organize like a teaching video and they have to record their videos and submit it. And then I comment that and they have to um, write a comment is very time consuming for online uh, class. Um, okay, the next one. I will record student conducting in the class and upload it through um, my platform. And they will write video reflection. Um, but the one thing that I found out that um, the platform that I'm using is very useful is um, a peer review. A peer review are required for online teaching since they could, couldn't have a comment um, from real ensemble. I think this is very good for um, communicate with um, other students in the class too. Um, let's move on to the last one. To be able to conduct the ensemble and organize the score, the courses are provide group presentation that acknowledge quiz uh, transpositions and organize the score. Um, which are our hard copy for in person, but for online. So they, it's very paperless. So they did that the whole thing, um, online submitting, taking a quiz online, um, video presentations of the state of playing um, and instrument. And we also ask for a guest lectures to um, give a presentation to our student also for the online um, class. Okay, so nowadays we, we know uh, many platform and application that we are using right now for online platform, Canvas, uh, Microsoft Teams, Google Cast and Webex, Zoom, Sign Up Google, Google Drive. For the whole this at Mahidon's instrumental basic conducting is using Canvas and Webex. And I have a lessons for that. So two main reasons for that is that they are Chinese students who cannot access the Google uh, devices at all. That's why so I, I have to use Microsoft Teams or WebEx on, and Zoom. The second one, uh, Mahidon University bought WebEx and Microsoft Teams subscriptions already. So we have to follow that. I mean, if we, we can use Zoom, we have to do an extra pay for, for that um, platform. Um, the one application that I think is very effective for me and 
I think I'm gonna continue to use it even if it's in person. That's the name Canvas. Uh, the reason of that because it's free. It's open for everyone. And also there is an application. So I think for Thai students, they always use um, everything like um, open YouTube and even learning conference that we are doing right now, they, they operate by uh, their phone or iPad more than their laptop. Okay, um, next one, the, pro the processing of the platform is match the need. Example, they, they provide grading, peer review, assignment. It makes education more effective and efficient to me. Teachers, students, parents are able to work and interact together from this application. It is able to combine classes. Okay, let, let me uh, review my first one. So um, for the first one, 100% online, like I just said, I operate through uh, through that application canvas sign up for the group presentations, but for the class conference at first um, For canvas the conference the class conference the all video conference is not very effective in the way of um, how um, How they how they operate the screen view I think for conducting or performance is not uh, very effective but rather than it may it may work for lecture class, uh, because of this, I prefer using Webex and Microsoft Team. Uh, for let me go through quickly for assessment. Assessment are very different. It's for more way to weekly conducting quizzes and group presentation, while the normal class will evaluate more weight to conducting quizzes to the real conducting. You know, it's more like a performance way for in person, but for the conducting um, online, we have to change the perspective a little bit for a search men for them. Okay, now let's move to the advantage of um, online conducting. Okay, the first one. I think using the new technology for them is, is very uh, useful for teachers and also for uh, our learning and learning how to record themselves. We even talk about how to set up the, um, the microphone, um, how to set up the video, like um, for the plan for video, they, they have to make sure that they can see the whole body. And even for the sound and, and um, recording sound, they have to have a separate um, recording device and then they, they have to mix it later on. Okay, the third one, using a new platform for learning, uh, fourth, learning experience, fifth, innovative conducting class. Okay, so, um, for this advantages of online teaching that I found. The mood and the class environment are very difficult to observe for improve myself teaching. And they also lack, a, they also kind of limit of focus for the whole class, for an hour class. Um, the poor output from the student side, even I try to prepare the good quality of um, uh, record recordings device, but if they open from their phones, um, the quality of the sound is changed. Um, the poor internet signal, which cause a delay, of course. Um, lack of conducting experience with the ensemble. I think this is a big point for um, conducting class. Lack of uh, reaction from an ensemble too. Okay, now we we on the. Uh, phase two. Right now, we do 100% in person, but however, uh, there are some foreigner students who live in outside of the um, country. Uh, so then I have to do mix 50 online and 50 um, offline for the whole class. So this is very difficult. It, it's caused a lot of um, 
a lot of work for for me but however we, we have no choice for that and i want um, foreigner student or international students to be involved in the class so we do both for online for them like an open video conference doing in-person class for resident and then we also require for other quizzes and and for the next step i'm thinking about to um to do teaching video for international students also because because um the the delay of the internet is called a lot of um you know um uh, involvement from from student okay lastly um private conducting um, student online um, and in person let me review this real quick so what is the advantages and this advantage that i found between these two online and um, in person this is a this is a costless problem because it's just a one person actually just one um, person in the class is less problems for me for online class i operate by learning thought uh, learning through video conference uh, video conference conducting lesson with ensemble so they have to find their ensemble like a local ensemble and like a set the ensemble and then he conduct the ensemble um, score reading this is a one that i require to score reading like a learn how to read the score and play um, on piano but the problem is for for online learning i cannot comment that right away and it's cause like uh, we have to wait for almost a week to you know to fix it and uh, as you can see he submitted a video of his playing uh, playing and singing on the score but however it's caused a lot of you know the quality of the sound and and maybe it, it took a lot of time to you know talk about just the one topic um and also one thing that i found about um uh, teaching private connecting online too i think the lack of good quality of microphone uh video and internet is cut delay and time consuming um in the purpose of learning to be a music director um project manager we have talked about programming writing proposal funding the possibility of a venues rehearsal plan and how to uh, bring the ensemble to his community i think this we can do online uh, no problem at all last a video review of his conducting video so i think most of most of the online conducting teaching we kind of do a lot of review video and comment feedback for that for example for the uh, review the video um, they have to analyze his that uh, his video for the minute and what happened at that time the improvement of how he gonna do better that what he did and even about the positive thing that he already did and he gonna write this stuff and he talk that uh, later on also okay um for the private connecting in person i just want to show you a little bit very um, quick about how i offer oh, sorry okay so this is an example because of um i mentioned this because in one lesson for conducting student they have to play and sing for score reading maybe 15 minutes and then they have to move on to conduct um, and talk about the score with me so if they set up the video only for you know piano and they have to move 
um, the video or you know the computer to another they have to they have to set up like a very mix in one lessons that costs a lot of time consuming but however i think it's worth to for um the, the graduate student who did the online he submit the video but i mean they they have time to review himself for what he did um the advantages of online private on my point of view lots of reviewing conducting videos that is very effective setting microphone video for online teaching so they they know and they learn how to do that set up the local ensemble for conducting lessons i think this is good like a push them to set their ensemble and do something with the the area and the, the community that they already live in living to be a director um, by set up the concert creating ensemble identity rehearsal plan writing proposal funding collaborating with other fields and organize the concert the repertoire will be um, involved with the educational plan for grass uh, conducting student and uh, musicians that we could uh, have with social distancing policy um, lastly this advantage of online um, private conducting lessons they are first first of all time consuming for lessons processing each week lack of observa observations of instructors on some rehearsals I, it is it is a very interesting uh, for conducting at as much as they can sit into other conducting rehearsal, they absorb more way and how to do um, rehearsal technique and how to rehearse ensemble from, from my point of view. Um, the, the repertoire will be remit due to local musician, poor internet and poor style quality and the high quality outputs uh, cost amount of um, extra budget. Yeah, um, that's it for me. Thank you very much. A uh, lot of interesting questions raised here. Um, any questions coming in via the Q&A or raising hand button? Uh, please, uh, please do. Uh, in the meantime, I have, I have a question as being somebody yeah. who sits very often in my, in my musical life on the other side, so being conducted. Uh, I know, yeah. I know, I know that um, a lot of the work of a conductor is psychological, is using the right language yeah. and uh, rehearsing technique. Also, really understanding uh, is this now something I can rehearse, or do I need to give the musician time to go back home and practice this again, and and yeah. just just to understand my demand and 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 sort it out themselves, um, and so. Uh, if you don't have this ensembles available as right now, so how are you addressing these issues? Um, mostly, first of all, I bring my uh, rehearsal video and like analyze with my student. Okay, I like a chair, chair what I did and what I thought first, and then they get the ideas about, oh, okay. So this is a thing that they have to notice about that. I open a lot of video, of um, different conductors and they kind of you know like a point about okay this conductor did this and what the reaction from the ensemble and what is different between other ensemble with the same um, piece so mostly i think like give a lot of information to them first but you know the it's a limit to get that experience by themselves right yeah. yeah. So to I'm, me, just give a lot of demands there. Absolutely. Uh, so that leads into my second question. Did you find to really adjust your normal syllabus and do things that you would otherwise do in a different order differently just because certain things would not work currently and you have to readjust your syllabus uh, through that? And as a second question, do you discover through that any things that you might have changed your syllabus for good? This is a good question. 
So um, for um, before COVID, we, we did a lot of um, conducting quizzes, like um, they're going to conduct in front of the ensemble, they're playing, and they conduct, rotate and comments at, at, at present time. Um, for the online, we require half of that, like a presentation, like a talk about um, um, that instrument, and even talk about instrument for conductor. Okay, but I think this is very good point to even this is a lecture, but this is a this is a good for student to talk about and ask about. Oh, so for example, like a how to how if I want this sound and how to ask a player to get this sound, or for example, like a how to shoot the the percussion mallets to get that sound. What kind of different you know so. I think that is this is a good for rehearsal too. Uh, okay, so back to this one. So half of like a fifty percent of my syllabus change to presentation. So, but the half of that they gonna have um to submit the video and that encourage them uh, them to singing the part is help for that year training. You know, I think. The whole thing of this, I will change it to uh, my normal syllabus. So presentation, review the video that we, we are doing right now. Um, and also for singing that part while conducting, rather than just, you know, come in front of the ensemble and, and conduct and sound is, is, is there. So yeah, I think I'm going to change these for my future syllabus. Very interesting. Do you have any questions coming in? Please use the Q and A button on top, or you can also raise your hand, and uh, one can open the microphone for you. If I understand. Also, from the other panelists, please just weigh in if you have any questions. Yes, I have again a question. <laughs> um, you actually very interesting that you mentioned. Um, you cannot use Google products because of students in China. I think this is a, this is yeah. something if you don't have students in China, you don't think about that, but that's actually quite a number of people in the world. Right. And also quite a number of music yeah. students who don't have access to that. It's actually very interesting to consider. Um, but you mentioned, or I want to ask, maybe I misunderstood. Did you say using all these platforms makes teaching more efficient or did I misunderstand that? Uh, do you mean which, which platform? Yes, correct. Yeah, you, you, you mentioned, you said like using these platforms make the teaching and, and the, the around, all this around uh, okay. more efficient. Yeah, yeah. So um, I using uh, first one for Canvas. I didn't, if I have more time, I'll show you about how, how it's, it's possible. Mm -hmm. So the first one, I think in just one platform, I can operate everything in just one application. I think it's good, like a grading um, announcement and put all uh, my materials in there. And, but for um, Google, Google or Google devices, it's not allow me to do that for Chinese students. Mm -hmm. So that's why I mentioned about the platform of Canvas. Uh -huh. All right. Yeah, because I, I honestly, I feel a bit that w with this whole using all these online platforms and all that, sometimes there is a bit administrative responsibility pushed to the teachers. <laughs> that yeah, maybe right, wasn't right, there you're before. right. Yeah, but yeah, but yeah, thank you. Right. That's my question. Thank you. I, I also, if I, if I may, in just a statement, and, and you can agree or disagree, I think it's something different in, in university students. I can actually expect them to uh, use certain platforms if they are available mm -hmm. to them of course whereas in yeah. in the teach in the teach in the private teaching sector uh, sector of especially younger students you have to take into account mm -hmm. which platforms the parents allow the students to use and uh, right. there are certain students who are not allowed to use facebook and therefore the facebook messengers or yeah. uh, anything and you need to make do with what they are allowed to use and especially you can't force them into yeah. into, into uh, any form of pay apps right Mm -hmm. Right, right. And like uh, we can communicate them in the same platform, email, and yeah, everything, parents, and yeah, just one platform. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Um, 
again, we will have more time for, for discussions afterwards. Uh, I want to introduce the next speaker, Dr. Superbon uh, Suman Pakti. Uh, hello. Uh, he is currently the assistant to the president of uh, Princess Kayani Vadana Institute of Music and a full-time lecturer there. And he is also the project director of the PYO. Uh, and he is mostly researching in, in creating new pathways uh, for uh, creating music and also performing music. Uh, he will present how his course that he teaches uh, in the school, uh, which is called Music for Society, which is focusing on, on, on an outreach uh, to different groups of the society, had to adjust during the recent period. Welcome, to Dr. Superbon. Uh, please start your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. And hello, everyone. So may, could you allow me to share screen? Oh, once again, I would like to say hello, everyone. Um, in Bangkok time right now, is a, I have to say good afternoon and the around the world. So hello, everyone again. I'm so Phong Suwon Pakti. I'm a faculty member of School of Music and Princess Kalyani Watana Institute of Music, Bangkok, Thailand. Uh, Today, my presentation, so it will focus on how, how um, can I develop the course that entitled Music for Society during the COVID-19 pandemic in this semester from the, um, because of um, the card is sound like a tie to uh, work uh, with the other people or general public to gathering the people work with the creative um, activity, creative musical activity in person or group person. Uh, now, I have, um, because of we have to um, do like a social distancing policy in the global, so I have to make from the in-person um, to be the social media platform. So first of all, I would like to back to the um, 2014 because I introduced this course, Music for Society, to the public in the first of uh, the Princess Galayani Watana Institute, uh, Princess Galayani Watana International Symposium 2014 that called Music for Society. It's a course um, to uh, integrate into the curriculum of the PGVM. The course is aimed to enhance uh, the student and young professional in their development uh, towards become professional um, musician with the broader understandings of the changing world. Um, in the development towards of the course, it will be um, the course is sound like uh, the lab for the student to practice, um, to bring their own musical knowledge, to create, uh, to be a musical activity, to work with the other people, why equip the understandings of socio-cultural change. Um, this focus, uh, uh, this co uh, the course focused on the idea of the professional development and let the student to develop their, skill, their skills in applying and of course the communications. I, it would be, um, sorry. Wait a moment, I have a problem with the screen sharing. Do, do, do you see one skin on the desktop? Yes, thank you. It's fine. It's back. Okay, o only one skin, right? Okay. And um, this year's symposium, I have learned a lot of the idea of the music chains, and a lot of the professor try to make our beloved um, music to move on these challenging times. And last Monday, um, Last Monday, Professor Wern's the keynote of the symposium, one of the keynotes of the symposium, he mentions about the music could change in the configuration of times and space, where the music situations occur, reshape the rule of interactions within that situation. And furthermore, yesterday, so I grabbed the annotize, so she asked about the her presentation, this music can be reflected, um, the humanity and equalities, as well as music could embrace the people um, to uh, the sympathy and sympathy. So, and of course, she is also a, a pioneer of the idea of music for society in Thailand. And, and she is also give me a lot of the milestone to work on it. For the music for society, um, uh, it's a core course of the PG Wim's Bachelor of Music program. The courses uh, encourage the student 
worked on Paxty to create uh, the music activity focusing on applying and the musical knowledge to benefit um, a community um, that suit with the condition they needed. So we learned this called it's all um, it's um, the method is all it is um, project based learning of PBL um, to let the student explore and practice from their music that they love. Uh -huh. Since 2014, I have to um, back to a little bit to let you know about um, the music for society course. Uh, wh what it is? What is the music for society course? And then we try to um, encourage um, to how to move to the um, online or the wor virtual for this semester. In 2014, we have run the course continuously for seven years. Um, um, there are a lot of the projects that develop from the music for society course. And for example, a community music drum club is based on the idea of selecting drum club in South Korea that I have a chance to work with Professor Sun Kim. For the course, I organized to pair the student, uh, I mean PGM student with the um, um, local kid um, to work it together um, to be understood by these children who participate in. Okay. And another reason why do we ask my students to work with those kids is because they are sharing a similar understanding of era. And from this understanding and how they extend to convey um, the music, um, uh, con con conveys uh, the music and, and so, uh, for society around them. And of course, I'm not forget to create the platform to, uh, to let them to perform. Um, after their work uh, as a workshop with the PGM student uh, on the stage. So you can see the, um, a lot of the community people around our school to come to cheer them up. And of course the audience in the classical music. I continuously to uh, work the project with the student in every semester. For example, in here, you can see a um, PGM student with a white shirt and a local school kid to have a chance to um, play the musical instrument. The course is organized the everyone meant for the student, um, the PGM student and the kids um, around the school to meet and learn fairly for violin, guitar, singing, and so on. Uh, as well as the showcase that their own parent participates at a community concert later. And of course, for the assessment, it's a two-side assessment uh, between um, student, featuring student and the local kid who participate in. So we can see the feedback or reflection. And the others, um, um, the other projects um, that is output from the Music for Society. Um, in here, I will uh, give you an example like a community theater and the cost tied to let the student to practice uh, the project. Um, that time in 2017 to celebrate the fifth year of the Princess Galaya Nivatina Institute of Music. We, student and I worked with the community to create um, the community theater inspired by a translation of the Her Highness Princess Galaya Nivatina Institute of Music's fables and premiere to the public or in May 2017. You can see a lot of the, um, in, on the screen, you can see um, a lot of my students um, they, tried, uh, they have to have the other idea to, um, to work with the music. In here, I, I mean that um, the student have a chance to workshop in theater and to try to have a chance to write the theater play by, by their own interpretation from the, and with the original music to like a, a musical community theater. And moreover, so, the idea of the music for society are expanded to be um, the students' volunteer project because of I take in charge about the student affairs in our institution. So student affairs team and I developed and grabbed the idea of the music for society um, to the student volunteer project. Um, we organized for three years two camps uh, at the national international camps. One is a um, axon sin creative music and art camps that have been ongoing development since 2018 on the field at um, Maokhu village, uh -huh, uh, Tak province, the northern part of Thailand, which constitute the current community. Um, and this project, we got the funding from the um, Her Royal Highness, Princess Mahajaki Srinthon to carry on and work on this project. Um, this one to try to develop in different um, university students from Chulalongkorn University, Thammasat University, um, uh, King Mongkut, 
uh, 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 Technology University and the Princess Galaya in Batsuna Institute of Music. Um, in here, though, there are a lot of the kind of um, students from different university. They come to work with the, um, you know, learn um, the local folk tune from the um, from from the local music channel there. So then try to create um, the activity at the past. For three years, there are a lot of the models that I, um, from first year, second year, and third year, we develop it a lot. And we have a lot of the output to um, do like a lesson learn on it. And the other camps, uh, we call that um, leadership camp, the music for society. Um, in English, we, we use the word connecting dream and chatting music is look, um, yeah. February, right? Uh, and of course, um, last year we have friends from our partner, um, our course partner, let's just say that um, from Yong Seo To Conservatory of Music, um, National University of Singapore, and so National University College of Music. And the same thing, we have to learn the local thing and um, to inspire the campus to develop and their milestone of the camp. And, uh, last um, for three years, um, Dr. No Taiji uh, such an honor to be an artistic director of the camp. So you can see how the um, students um, who participate in the project um, uh, they fun and they learn a lot because of sometimes um, the old thing they are going to miss. So that we try to work on the local idea to create the creative uh, musical um, musical creative activity to do to that. Back to right now, um, I'm not right now, sorry. Last semester, I had a, a, a opportunity to give a lecture in social life skill course at Tamsa University, Faculty of Economics. Um, the course objective is similar to the music for society. And for this, uh, for this course, so we plan to work the creative project at the second half of the course. We run, um, from the beginning of the course, the first half, uh, we, we, we run uh, in regular class. So something like this, the class is run regular from the beginnings of the semester until the midterm exam. Um, we go about facing with the COVID-19 pandemic. So the course could not run as usual. The government has now that all the university must to move the normal class platform to be the online platform immediately. So the class um, has changed um, to be online, be like this. From here, little thing to be a virtual. So um, the student at the Faculty of Economics, they, they all not the music yet anyway. So we will try to work with the project um, that we call concert video COVID thing. So an easy um, creative work that um, let the student um, who are non musician to develop um, uh, step by step easily. So, but they try, uh, they, and finally they work very, very good. So why, back to my process for the second half of the, those called TU 102, um, we plan very carefully and try to work on the tutorials on online. So we using the Zoom, um, we just using the Zoom and try to separate to be uh, to have the tutorial to the student to use the tool or and all epic uh, other applications um, to work on it. So this one it is quite co co complicated something like this. So. It's a good time for the 21st century skill that the student has to learn the other things, not only the number that the um, economic student work on it. So they learn, try to work on um, the, uh, the platform Zoom and Google Classroom. Uh, and of course, there's some uh, video editing program uh, in here, uh, iMovie or any final cut. I would like to show you uh, the finals of the uh, products of the course. Uh, one of video clip that they try to present it to the people about the um, awareness um, in uh, during the challenging time of COVID-19. Do 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 do
COVID-19 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 Don't forget to put your mask on COVID-19 COVID-19 No set outside Stay at home Take care yourself Dangerous Danger dangerous Dangerous Danger dangerous Maybe it's an example. So um, even um, Professor Mark Reifer, the show that I captured immediately um, to show that um, that you show that how to synchronize teaching. So I totally agree on it because of um, the second half that we plan to work the project with the students. So it's meant to set clear rule in that one. That is definitely yes and over clear with the instruction of an, an explanation. So I totally agree on it. Uh, thank you, Mac, to summarize for my presentation first. And um, next, um, back to the PGM. So last semester, so um, um, I have to say that um, the course is finished before the school course um, because of the COVID. So last semester, the course also worked in the primary school kit to merging the music card, um, the school kit um, around the PGM area to advocate and inspire kids to merging um, the, the primary school schedule in music class. It's experiment for the kids to paint and learn music through the creative activity led by PGM students. And the PGM student might draw their musical element to be a material to give the experience to the school kids. It's and the some a little bit output of the um because of we try to provide the showcase of the uh, after the workshop or uh, lesson end. Um, it means that the PGM student um for for, for last example they show you about the Agule ensemble. It means that the PGM student um they have to have the experience to know how to play the Akulele uh, before they went to the field to workshop the school kit. It, um. We try to organize the a workshop course before the uh, on the field start. But some students try to have the honor to instruct, instruction material to let the kid to understand easily as a photo on the screen. Uh, not only the ukulele, we have the violin team uh, to teach the violin shortly only one semester with them. We have a showcase like a ukulele showcase. And of course, we have a little bit about after um, the mid of March, I think. So after the school course, because of the COVID pandemic, so we have to do some reflections with the student. Uh, we are assuming, um, yeah, it's still good. You know? last semester. For this semester, so we, I have to change the idea, a lot of things, because of we try to, the essence of it, so we have to work with the, stu, uh, with the other people um, to know and perceive how uh, the music um, and the society's awareness and everything. And for this semester, the problem is we could not work with the people in person activity because of the social distancing. First, I draft the course to let uh, the student discuss together is it possible with it or not. So for this semester, I plan the course something like this. You can see it's my plan to work with the student in this semester. Last two week, last two week, um, I orientation the course and discuss about the music during the COVID-19 outbreak. And the second thing we try to uh, seeking the possibility to engage the people through the online platform. This one we have great from Dr. Tanapon. And the third one last week, um, um, the topic on how to go viral, the Sadi Sonata, the Thai 
to Thai violinists and they quite succeed um, on the social media. Um, more than 3 million views, views on the YouTube and down Facebook. And a lot of the practicing from the first beginning and the second, the second half of the, after the first presentation. So, however, um, the students have to always, the essence of the course that should be three main things that they try to apply the musical knowledge to benefit to the community is one, a communication to general public, value and conscious mind. So this three things that they have to think about on it. Uh -huh. So the first card I run to explore what happened with the music during the COVID-19 that I told you before, that could uh, gather the people. Then I discussed with them if we change from gathering people to the social media platform, uh, how can we do the essence of the practice of this card? Then I discussed, so which platform is it possible to let the people to interact you, like an interactive approach? So Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Kahoot or Mentimeter is some, something like a one-way um, one feedback. So there are not a um, um, so chance to let the other people to participate or do some challenge. And SMU, um, of course, it's possible to do, do it, but it's not quite extremely like the TikTok. So my student pick this um, complete functional software, TikTok. So because of um, free, it's free application and easy to share on the social media platform and like interactive approach and easy to make video production, uh, editing uh, and do some subtitle or some, uh, um, some word that's in, in influence to um, the, the idea of the music for society and complete functional software, of course. And the second class, I have um, the opportunity to discuss with uh, Dr. Tanapon uh, in my class. Um, and um, the possi possibility to engage the people to the online media platform. So I try to analyze and synthesize it with my students that um, there are three, four things is possible to do on it. Okay, we can see first is do like a cover song, singing duet, maybe pop or rap, um, Kodai, Hansai, do uh, compose a piece like a piano or round a song. And the second thing is the part of the rhythm. Maybe we can do some the cap along or rhythmic activity or body percussion or some a little bit improvisation. And introduce the musical instrument. It is another way to, to share the idea of the music to let the people know about the classical music or any music anyway. And maybe some people would like to do some for fun. So maybe we have the other thing is for fun, um, maybe let the people smile, that's it. And the second thing we, um, the last week that we work on is concept to how, how, how to go viral actually. So after we discussed with the instructor and we, we got this one. So they have to concern the image first, the sound production or sound quality, uh, emotional connection, uh, productions, what else? Culture in common, compositions um, in music and the art related to like an image or um, any scene, something like that. And of course the promotion. After this symposium, I mean next week, um, our creator, this is my student for this class this, this semester. So they are going to create um, the um, video that try to let the sense of the music society to share with the people on online. Or maybe we can um, get more the audience who can participate it later. So now they has already to create uh, the TikTok um, account. So if from, from now to maybe not to we, you, you, you can all exit and maybe do some challenge on it for this platform. Well, in sum up, this is the way that I try to learn the course for this semester um, to hope 
um, that it would be work to let the people gathering on the social media. We will try to work on the essence of the cause of God that I aforementioned to suit with the context of now. As I believe an art and music has no borderline, although the context of now, we musicians have to make music and educate at distance communications. I believe that the people's always need music, whether while or real concert or real things. So we should have the confidence from our music to share because of music will be needed now more than ever. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for sharing this. We have a fantastic comment uh, just coming in from Thank you, uh, Douglas uh, Bacharik. Uh, he's, he says the topic raises real questions about what society is. Uh, various government responses to COVID seem to be spawning new societies where music making is becoming something quite different and seemingly less social or only virtual social. So he, he makes a point that there's a big difference between the real society and the virtual society. What are your thoughts about this? Um, for me, real societies, um, I, I mean, the people can share more than the online time, but the online society is also society, but in a different way. Um, for, 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 for me, um, for this challenging situation time, so we try to um, organize the cause that, to, that aim to uh, based on the essence of the cause. So we have to change. But actually, if we're back to normal thing, maybe a new normal, so we, 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 we have to expose uh, what is the method of the teaching class would be. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think that's also something that we have to see a couple of years down the road, uh, how much how much the societies that now develop more and more online um, are becoming very different from what society used to mean to us and whether we actually separate different groups in society even further. And that links back to maybe outreach to, to, uh, to, to your project. Um, Maybe not so much directly related to your presentation, but since you are very much involved in, in outreach, do you do you feel that we are actually losing uh, opportunities to reach out um, on two aspects? In traditional time, music is and traditional music in Southeast Asia is normally taught from a master to a student in a direct personal contact, and very not that much is written down, uh, but it's very much a skill transferred. Um, that is one aspect that uh, might now move online as well. And the other question, and it links a little bit back to what Max said before, are we, are we creating a social divide even further because some students just don't have the opportunities to have a solid internet connection or even using any online platforms because uh, there might be one computer in the entire household, if at all, and that one is occupied by the parents who need that for their work. And so there's just not the financial means. Or there, or there are regions in Thailand, as we all know, that where there is just no proper internet connection. So how, uh, how can we, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah. For example, many, many universities, um, for, for, for example, to exceed the student who can't accept that much uh, for the internet um, in, in, in a lot of Thai universities. So they try to support by give the like an internet kit to the student to to let them to approach um, the online course. And the other thing so that we know that it means that there are a lot of the free that the student has to pay a lot, not only the computer and the and the other thing. So it means that a lot and every university, I think, that reduce the tuition fees for this year in Thailand. So that's a good sign to help the student to can catch the online lesson. Um, yeah, I'm not quite sure that is correct or not. I see Max having also a question. I, yeah, because it, it, it's connected <laughs> to that. I think one of the things that, that, that we always have to keep in mind, I, I don't know how it 
how it was in, in your country where you are at the moment or where you're from, but um, there were countries where music was specifically not considered as relevant to the system. Um, and it's still not. I and mean, when we see like countries opening up, but things like concert, concerts are maybe allowed at the end or under very, very strong restrictions. So I think a project like yours, uh, Ajahn Sopapon, is, is um, so strong because it makes music and culture relevant to the society, relevant to the system. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I think we, we musicians have to really be aware of that and um, don't let this chance slip to say that either or, digital or not, we are relevant. Yeah, yeah. And let's not even dive into how, how relevant economically um, the, the arts and culture um, field is, but that's a different subject now. Yeah. Mm. But I would like to share a little bit because of before I came to Boscat to present my uh, my my work, um, I have just back from the Faculty of Medicine uh, and the Public Health from the Northern New Royal Academies of Medicine in Thailand. So they need music like like us because of they try to work on how music can relevant to the people like Max says before and. We, we, we try to work with the project to let to the music approach. Now the teaching, um, for example, in the class, so my student is good at technology rather than me. You know what I mean? So some, 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 um, some function or some, you know, some method that, 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 that taught me a lot. So that's it. So now we, the, the, the teachings nowadays should be changed. It's not we give the, some information to the student, but we have to share two side learning between lecture, lecturer and the student. So we learn each other together all the time. Yes. Uh, thank you, uh, Superpoint, for your presentation. Um, I, I, I'm very impressed that you are able still to instill music ideas and values even in non-music majors you know, mm -hmm. or programs that are not related to arts. My question is, um, how would you measure level of engagement when you're so used to face-to-face -face community projects? Now you have to transfer into this digital mediated environment. How, how you know, interactions that were once mm. direct, how, how are you going to know and measure those interactions? Now it's all online. Um. We we, we we can access, but not at all. We can access in the way of how many people to um, watch the video and how many people to interact to the content that my student create and what else. Um, so for, for now, it's time to developing. So I'm, 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 I have, I, I, I can't, I, I don't know the result end for now. So I can tell you after this semester ends. So yeah. <laughs> Sorry, but I talk, we we try we, we try our best to carry yes. on this um, participations music uh, activity to always to work always with the other people. Yes, we look forward to hearing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah. yes. Well, well, actually, we have there is definitely some follow ups to this discussions today yeah, necessary, yeah. Um, and we will have uh, also some time at the end to uh, discuss more. Now, you heard already Dr. Chung Xin Ying uh, uh, speaking. Uh, she and Jeremy Leong uh, both lecturing at the research and researching at UCSI in Kuala Lumpur uh, and on, in different fields uh, from social outreach and, and, and uh, the problems of, of race and gender in, in outreach to uh, general research methodology and so on. You can read again if you want the uh, CVs on, on our website for this event. Uh, they will be now presenting about the app that we are currently using and uh, that so many people got to love, to hate, to whatever, uh, worry and, uh, and uh, many things that is Zoom and how Zoom for them pre uh, presents the issues and opportunities that come with it. Please go ahead with your presentation. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction, Christophe. Um, so I'm just going to start by saying that our presentation is unique in that sense that it's more academic. So we'll be re reading from a script, but that's okay. So I'll start first. In the past decade or so, endorsing the call towards mass education, several universities, including some prestigious ones such as MIT, Yale and Carnegie Mellon University, have actively offered many quality online courses to the public. 
While one may argue such educational initiative was merely part of a broader marketing strategy for these institutions, there's no doubt that the values of which these courses offer, as well as the ease of access to many learners of diverse backgrounds across the globe, cannot be denied. In Malaysia, local entrepreneurs and educators have tapped onto the online open learning platform to market their online courses. For instance, human resource trainer Norizan Sharif offered professional development courses in Bahasa Malaysia or Bahasa Melayu to university graduates. And civil engineer Bruce Lee designed online courses to share his knowledge of building information modeling to professionals in the construction industry. For foreign universities with campuses in Malaysia, Professor Graham Candle, Provost and Pro Vice Chancellor of the University of Nottingham, Malaysia, commented on how the COVID-19 pandemic had swiftly changed the way human communication was conducted. Online tools such as Microsoft Teams and Zoom, which are used primarily for meetings, are now being used for delivering courses. He also observed the proliferation of webinars in place of I quote, physical conferences, workshops, and seminars, and how these new online platforms could potentially help to save travel time, as well as allowing some individuals to multitask while attending a webinar. All these, he asserted, were positive development in the way knowledge was transmitted in higher education. And not only was it more cost effective, it was environmentally more friendly as well. Interestingly, his mentioning of the teleconferencing platform Zoom deserves further examination, especially in terms of its effectiveness in delivering courses. With the sudden onslaught of COVID-19, UK newspaper The Guardian reported that Zoom was downloaded 2.3 million times around the world on 23rd of March 2020. No doubt this sudden spike in usership speaks to the utility of this platform Yet at the same time, it also brought up deep concerns over online security and privacy issues. Soon users were complaining about lapses in security with strangers known as Zoom bombing or Zoom raiding appearing in private meetings and conferences. On 9th April, Singapore's Ministry of Education temporarily suspended the use of Zoom in home-based learning when female students had received indecent proposals and being shown viewed photos. Since then, Zoom has sought to improve on security by encouraging users to generate a password to log into meetings and enabling the waiting room feature. Starting 27 December, September, Zoom will further tighten its security measures by requiring all meetings to have a password or having the waiting room feature enabled. For meetings without a password or waiting room enabled, Zoom will automatically enable the waiting room feature for you. Also, a user can customize the waiting room feature so that individuals in his or her approved list can bypass it and go directly to join the meeting. With these security measures in place, Zoom has proven to be a useful tool in teaching both classical and popular music history classes at UCSI University Institute of Music during the pandemic. Despite the varying challenges music educators face in the transfer of teaching online, more academically oriented and objective subjects such as music history seem to fit well in this online learning mode. In this paper, we would like to share our experiences of using Zoom to teach music history at our institution. Areas such as classroom management, measuring learning outcomes, and how to motivate our students on the Zoom platform serve as the focuses of our presentation. First, one of the advantages of Zoom is that the features are designed to be user-friendly. For us, they most closely replicate the experience of teaching and learning in a physical classroom, and in some ways even went beyond that. The whiteboard on Zoom functions just like one in an actual classroom, but with an added advantage of saving all the information for future reference. Furthermore, the entire lecture can be recorded and saved for students who are absent from class or for those who wish to revisit the topics covered again. For presentation, the available features of allowing multiple participants to share screen and computer sound, as well as the ability to optimize the screen sharing for video clip, essentially mimic how group presentation is conducted in an actual class setting. Nonetheless, the lack of human interaction and interpersonal relationships, especially in a digitally mediated environment, 
might heighten the sense of isolation, leading to a decline in motivation. The much needed human factor here could be replicated in a Zoom meeting through a few functions such as raise hand, hand clap, and thumbs up, which are intended to demonstrate participation and response without interrupting the flow of the lecture. The raise hand function was often used to indicate a need to ask questions, simulating an extra scenario in a face-to-face -face classroom. Apart from that, lecturers who are at loss engaging the responses of students in a virtual classroom could anticipate quick responses through these functions while helping students to establish an online social presence, even while in front of their laptops and electronic devices. Secondly, classroom management is made easy with the waiting room function, especially if a lecturer has an attendance policy that penalizes tardiness. By enabling that function, students will not be able to join the class immediately, but be placed in a holding room. For those who are late, the lecturer will know as they must be given permission to enter and join the class. Also, we can easily track the names and faces of students who attend the class on Zoom. But as an added precautionary measure, a lecturer can make a roll call at the beginning and conclusion of a class and requires each student to respond by typing a yes answer in the chat box to indicate their attendance. With their name appearing together with their answer, this will ensure that every student stays through the entire duration of the class. On the other hand, lack of student participation and involvement are some of the reported issues often found in an e-learning classroom. Responding to such challenges, the lecturer can utilize the function of breakout rooms to conduct group discussions and activities reminiscent of an actual classroom. The breakout room feature allows the lecturer to distribute students effectively into virtual rooms while they are able to conduct their own discussions separate from the main meeting in real time. The lecturer is able to set the duration of each breakout session, broadcast a message to everyone in the separate rooms, and most importantly, hop between rooms and visit each group in the midst of their discussion to offer any help or advice. This has been most effective in the conduct of group activities and discussions online, giving the students immediacy of contact with each other within the confines of their own homes and spaces. Learning often takes place not necessarily through a unidirectional transmission of knowledge, but also through a constructivist environment where interactions between instructor, student and content need to flow in a multi-directional manner. The ability to engage with their peers in breakout sessions is important as it not only gives students a sense of autonomy in their own learning, but also provides mutual support throughout the learning process, which helps in the better engagement with their subjects. And now I shall pass my time to Assistant Professor Dr. Jeremy Leung. Thirdly, the discussion of race and politics while not outrightly banned, remains relatively sensitive in Malaysia's higher education institutions. In teaching popular music courses of America, discourses of race in jazz and rock music are an integral part of understanding how popular music culture participates in a symbiotic relationship with American society, shaping its politics by unraveling issues of social justice, injustice, and advancing the causes of ethnic and sexual minorities. By localizing and contextualizing these discourses for our music undergraduates, it has helped to narrow the geographical distance and encourage them to think more critically about the impact and relevance of racial politics in Malaysia. However, Perhaps because of the Bumiputra policies enacted in the 1970s, whose effects are still enforced today, Mal Malaysia's ethnic minorities, such as the Chinese and Indians, may have either felt a sense of political apathy or given up hope for change in light of the recent political unrest following the sudden resignation of Prime Minister Mahathir Mohamad. What seems clear is that the discussion of race, politics, and popular music is often greeted with long pauses or uncontroversial answers, especially when it is a racially mixed class. Interestingly, conducting these courses on Zoom 
somehow encourages a freer and perhaps more nuanced form of expressions to emerge in the chat room. Yet speaking up on racial issues in online classes continues to be a huge challenge for them. This phenomenon deserves further investigation. Could it be because online platforms such as Zoom give them the perception that they are alone and not surrounded by their peers who may be of a different race? What is even more intriguing is that some students will make use of the private chat function to express their personal thoughts on race issues in Malaysia. Obviously, such personal revelations are meant for the lecture, and they may even appear in an inopportune time where the topic of discussion has changed. Certainly, this is a challenge in teaching online, where managing expectation and practicing discretion is called for in order not to interrupt the flow of the lessons. Fourthly, the polling features on Zoom has proven to be an added advantage in the measures of students' learning outcomes. The absence of nonverbal gestures and bodily cues in an online classroom has made it much more difficult for lecturers to gauge students' comprehension level. A poll incorporating brief questions with multiple choice selections could be taken at the beginning or end of a class as a way to measure students' understanding of a topic. These polls would take into account the response of every student without risk of being overlooked by the lecturer. The results of the polls would then be displayed privately to the lecturers in percentage before being given a choice to broadcast them to the rest of the class. The results would represent a broad overview of students' level of engagement and comprehensibility while protecting the anonymity of the students who voted in the polls. This is also helpful for the lecturers to assess his or her teaching skills and how well information has been transmitted to the students in an online platform. Staying motivated is a key challenge in online education. Without their peers around, students may develop a sense of loneliness and isolation studying online. In fact, many studies have confirmed that a lack of motivation is a main cause of student dropout. However, when motivation is present, students are more willing to persevere when they encounter problems in their courses. In recent years, gamification had garnered a lot of attention in higher education as a pedagogical approach to motivate students in their coursework. Though a novel idea, Yong Ju Khan's PhD dissertation concluded that in online music instruction, there, is, there was no significant difference in student motivations between those who are taught by game-based online course versus those in web-based online instruction. In fact, he pointed out that the overemphasis on multimedia learning materials could have a negative impact on student achievement. Building confidence, he affirmed, was the most important motivation factor in improving students' performance. In the Malaysian context, educators had identified several issues with online education that affected student motivation, such as unstable internet connection, lack of a clear purpose to focus on, and not having a routine with online courses, among others. These challenges are real. And what we have done with teaching music history on Zoom is to first establish a positive mindset about online learning. Students must feel supported whenever they have questions about the course materials. An alternate communication channel should be made available when internet connectivity fails. In addition, Implementing regular class schedules, using positive reinforcement in learning, and emphasizing the function and roles of music in society are the various ways in which we strive to make the study of music history relevant and engaging on the Zoom platform. In conclusion, our presentation today concerns a specific case of teaching music history 
designed to address a set of circumstances that have arisen in our institution from the pandemic. It is by no means the only way to teach music history in a higher learning institution. Although not necessarily negative issues, there is some perceived limitations concerning the usage on Zoom for teaching. For example, the 40 minutes restriction imposed on multiple users for non-subscribers in each meeting could be seen as a disadvantage. However, the pandemic compelled us to rethink new pedagogical strategies, and as such, this restriction could very well be welcomed as a new strategy. In our experience, reported difficulties of maintaining concentration throughout a 90 minutes lecture among students is not unusual. In a bid to prevent experiences of Zoom fatigue, our music history lectures were segmented into two 40 minute sessions with a 10 minute break in between. By adapting our lectures to fit around the given time allowance on Zoom, we have found this to be much more effective in terms of content delivery without compromising on the quality of teaching. On the other hand, while not exclusive to the Zoom platform, online teaching has prompted a rethinking of assessment as traditional forms of evaluation, such as quizzes and exams, may not truly reflect students' learning capability. This is especially relevant as issues of integrity and fairness would be undermined in the conduct of online examinations. As such, more pra practical-based assessments could be offered as a means to emphasize practical knowledge as the learning outcome, which best serve as the model of education for the future. While the shift towards online teaching is increasingly normalized in a COVID-19 environment, and possibly thereafter, the success story of Zoom as an online teaching platform is a testament to its versatility and adaptability, rather than merely viewed simply as a video conferencing tool. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Chung. Thank, thank you, Dr. Leong. Um, before we move to a more general discussion, are there any questions to what uh, was just shared? Any coming in from the public? From the other panelists? Um, I have I have a short question to ask. Um, in, and this, you brought up the, the point of, of student engagement. It's also when you hold a lecture, uh, especially in a multicultural and multi-language environment, you as a, as a lecturer very often need to read off the faces of the students, whether they just got what you said, right? Or whether you need to rephrase it or you want to uh, go slower or, fa or, or can go faster. Um, how do you address this problem in a, in a Zoom lecture? Um, I, I realized that despite not being able to look at their faces while they're presenting, um, what does the online teaching platform really prompt students to do is to be more assertive in their learning. So a lot of them are much more um, on the ball when it comes to not really understanding certain issues. They really utilize the function of the chat group or they would just raise hand and unmute themselves and ask things. Um, the whole version and the whole platform of online learning really forces them to be responsible, you know, to, to, to make sure that they ask if they don't understand. And, and um, they, they really appreciate, you know, the use of private chat and, and group chat. Um, because sometimes, as, as in Asian context, actually voicing out and raising hands in the actual classroom, it seems very daunting. Whereas in, in, in a Zoom online uh, platform, it, it gives them much more easeability to, to, to ask questions without being, you know, without having the pressure of their peers looking at them or, or, or questioning or why are they asking questions. So, so in, in a way, it actually gives them much more freedom and flexibility to ask questions, even though compromising in terms of verbal cues um, um, you know, I'm, I'm not expecting them to actually turn on the videos as they are presenting because um, of bandwidth, you know, and yes. because of uh, the, some students just have 
poor internet connection, um, that, that, that is not an issue because um, those who are actually much shyer in classes, they would just ask in, in, in a group chat or private chat function. So that's my experience. Mm -hmm. I, I have to kind of second my colleagues' uh, uh, answers on that because more, more so than now, you know, March 20, March 18, suddenly the entire Malaysia shut down and everyone has to go online. And this transition from a very physical classroom of teaching music history, I teach, you know, jazz and, and pop history and, and rock history. Um, even those students would not actually talk much in class or raise hands to ask questions. I mean, many of the topics are rather controversial. The this with race, you know, African American slaves, slavery, how that affects jazz development, so on and so forth. Um, and even when I was trying to try to contextualize, because America is such a far country compared to Malaysian students here, uh, making it more relevant to, you know, comparing the majority Malay versus the Chinese and Indians, they would not ask questions. Mm -hmm. What I find that once we move onto the online platform, as I mentioned in my paper, I feel more willingness to comment on issues of race, and it is a bit more sensitive to go on the private chat and send me messages. Now, the issue here is, uh, is, is a good development because I don't see that in physical classrooms. And now they feel that freedom to comment because now there's a certain sense of privacy that was not available to them in the physical classroom. So I think that's the plus side of teaching online, at least for me, you know, in terms of teaching pop history in that sense. Uh, and when I don't see students, the quieter ones, as I said, they would not say a word in class starting to come. Yeah. And Absolutely. Funny thing about online chatting, that sometimes they don't realize what they are saying. They just were eagerly participating and then, you know, everyone is reading the comment. As if it's mm. this freedom of, of this flow of thoughts just come through the chat. I guess this is the sense of the, the millennial generations that are still used to texting. They don't really think as much. They just go as <laughs> quickly as And I find that really intriguing. And I find that it's useful. At least they are participating, you know, in, 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 in a really sense. Since you mentioned the uh, the problem of race and, and race in Malaysia, and you mentioned the term uh, Bumiputra, uh, would you mind for our non Southeast Asian listeners uh, in to explain what that actually means? You want me to. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm not wanting to open a can of worms. It's, it's absolutely law in Malaysia. So I, I think it's important for the listeners to understand the, your, your side of the story yeah. to understand what this term means. I'm a Singaporean, you see. I'm not from Malaysia. I think that uh, okay. I will let her explain. Um, so the, the word Bumiputra is actually a Malay term, uh, which means uh, princess or. or uh, Princes of the land, so so the owners of the land, sons of the land, um, and it, it's a term that was coined um, in, in the very early stages where the country was first constructed and formed um, to give privileges to the the first people of the land, and this concerns um, mostly the indigenous tribes and also the Malay ethnic groups. And um, bearing in mind that Malaysia is such a multicultural society. Uh, the largest and the most dominant racial uh, ethnic group is the Malays and they made up about uh, close to 60% of the population here. Um, so the Bumi Putra policies here started in the form of uh, giving prominence to this group of people which includes the indigenous groups and also the Malay groups. Um, now this sort of positive reinforcement started uh, way back in the 60s and 70s uh, to help to uh, really bolster the economic profile of these uh, uh, racial groups um, because of this disparity. Um, now, it became uh, something that is quite imbalanced uh, and, and uh, right now it's qu still quite sensitive because uh, positive reinforcement in a way is supposed to increase the uh, mobility of this racial group to be much more independent in their economic background, but it hasn't been seen the case as such. Um, but on the other hand, it shows that uh, the other racial minorities have been overlooked in many ways. 
including uh, sectors of business, economy, government, yeah. politics, and also education, which is why you know, this is such a big issue and because it affects every part of uh, the society here in Malaysia. Uh, and I, I'm not going to comment so much as, as how you know, this inequality and the biases of this comes on to play, but um, it's, it's enough to say that race is a very prevalent uh, issue here and in, um, it affects all parts of our lives. Um, so much so that um, there's a lot of um, uh, responses that uh, we, we have towards it, but because it's such a sensitive issue, uh, the government tends to censor and be very careful about what is being said, especially in the media. So uh, students especially has been brought up in an environment that these kind of issues are not to be really verbalized. You know. and, and this is also has to do with a bit of a history that we have a May 13 racial riots uh, back in 1969. Uh, uh, this is where the very, very early stages of the country is being developed. And uh, that has really left a black mark in the history of Malaysia where different racial groups are uh, against each other. And, and from then on, it has been really, really sensitive race, uh, religion uh, and politics has always been so I also still as an aftermath of the Malaysian state of emergency. If one reads wants to read up more on that, they will find that information. That's the happening yeah. in terms of that. Yeah. So thank you for clarifying that. I want to get uh, back to uh, one one other point that um, you shared, and this is about the motivational aspect and that the gamification. Uh, and the other th things, as musicians, I think we all know that a, a big part of, of, of motivation comes from um, from actually being able to having achieved something, from now being able to play that and see, looking back on the journey, that is the motivating part, and um, that leads then to, and I want to now go more into the uh, into the open discussion with everyone, please to share in and also our audience to please do raise hand and ask questions via the Q&A button. Uh, via the uh, personal contact uh, between teacher and student as a motivational factor. Uh, and my first question would, would be whether, whether you see in just that one single aspect, the, how one can motivate a student uh, when is, you see a big difference between doing this online or while doing this in-personal con uh, uh, con contact. Please, whoever wants to answer first, please go ahead. Very briefly summarize because you know we have to yes. put together this. Um, teaching music history is a challenge in real life. I mean, physical classroom, let alone everything is transferred online in a sense because I think that students come into learning about music history, even music students with certain baggage, as music history is a bunch of events, dates to memorize, and then during tests, you just regurgitate the answers, and then that's the end of it. And both of us has tried very hard to well, build the new generation of musicologists, orientate ourselves to this kind of you know, factual regurgitation, so to say in class. But to tie the facts to what's the more um, real life experience, so to speak. Right? So when we talk about music history, yes, we still use dates and facts, but the facts has to tie back to how the individual composers or musicians uh, think about their lives. So at least for me, teaching popular music, there's a lot of storytelling, right? How you craft the facts into a story is very important. And not only telling a, a good story, but how is the story going to impact the performers? Because this is a performance boost. Let's, for example, you know, we talk, I talk about uh, Louis Armstrong, for example. You know? He's one of the biggest jazz musicians, well, some would say the best known jazz musician in the world, and how telling his life stories about struggle and defeat, right? even such a great musician has the low point in their lives. And how to prepare our musicians, contempt students down here that, you know, look at all these great musicians that you admire, 
Now, it's not all rosy journey being a great musician, you know. There's a lot of hurdles that comes internally as well as externally, right? The journey to become a great musician is never straightforward. And through this kind of storytelling, they learn, right? And learning techniques how to overcome challenges when they see when they graduate to become a musician themselves, right? And how the great musicians overcome certain challenges, economic challenges, uh, drugs issues, uh, even anxiety issues. So then they see the relevance of music history in the sense as lessons to be learned, as they become aspiring musicians, as they graduate mm -hmm. uh, from here in that sense. Yeah. So I think that is a very important to make music history relevance in that sense. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I was also talking about the sense of um, positive reinforcements. Right? Um, maybe in a very Asian context, we tend to be more critical as teachers rather than giving praises. And I'm very cautious of that. And I think that judicious use, careful use of praises, Say, this is great answers. You know, how do you come about that? Right? James, right? do you want to comment on Tom's answer? This is a great answer. What do you think about that? That creates a community of learners online. Yeah, you break down the barriers of online learning to mimic more and on of a physical classroom. The mm -hmm. fact is that in a physical classroom, they will hardly speak. But the isolation actually allows them to comment. Either mm -hmm. Right. If they are not comfortable, chat. If you are comfortable, turn on the mic. Absolutely, absolutely, yes. So to because the benefits of online teaching that I never realized. Mm -hmm. oh, wonderful. Uh, Dr. Superburn. Um, I have a very, oh, very... So, so, yeah. <laughs> oh, sorry, oh, sorry, I'm sorry. No, 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 you're please go ahead. <laughs> uh, no, questions, yes. Uh, Dr. Superburn, please, your answer to the question. Yeah, for me, I, I think that the education for now today, so we have to motivate the student. Um, um, it sounds like a, um, how do you say, lifelong learning is become to be real. Because of now, we can contact the other people quite easier because of, because of the technology. For example, in here, Zooming or the other thing. So we can share the knowledge and we can share, um, show uh, what is the possibility to making music um, and the other education to try to integrate so we can exchange the idea is quite fast rather than the past so that is a good point of the online learning so i think that uh, if we have to motivate the students it means that um the content it should be uh, the, the content of the lesson it should be quite uh, it should be up to date and of course and should be has a but possibility to integrate through the other thing to be a good, uh, to be a new knowledge. So I don't think that um, online teaching and all the normal class teaching is a problem. It means that it, de it depends on of the, for example, as we are teachers, so that's why we have to uh, adapt and flex and have the flexibility to work on it as well. So that's my comment. Thanks. Uh, uh, Banabat, you also had a comment to this, right? Max, Max. Um, for me, because in my contest, um, I met some some children who came with no motivation to learn music at all because their parents want them to learn. So it's the teacher's um, obligation to try to motivate them to learn. And yes, I agree with uh, Dr. Superpoint that uh, in traditional or in online is pretty much the same. But I found the benefits of an online class that we have more tools to use, mm -hmm. like tech. Um, digital tools or games application. So after we communicate with the students to find what they really like, what they need, what is their goal, try to uh, convince them to see the benefits of music, then we can apply many tools like digital tools to motivate them to learn and to, I mean, um, to, to enjoy the music more. Yes. Mm -hmm. Max? Yeah, uh, uh, allow me to, to have a, maybe a slight different take uh, on that. Um, I think we have to divide, um, or we have to look at what is this, the teaching environment. If we teach, of course, for, if we teach younger kids, then of course motivation is a thing, um, is very important. Um, although from, from my experience, if, if the teacher delivers 
engaging content. I think motivation will be will come more or less automatically, more or less. But I think when we look at universities, I have to say, I, I honestly don't really understand the idea of we have to motivate them. I think the moment the student enters, uh, enters the university, they want to study this, right? And if even then, I don't know, when they are 22, 23, they are in a university, they want to become professional musicians and we still have to motivate them, they might not make it in the professional market if they always need someone who is there with the, with the cane in the back. So I think, I think what is very important, we have to um, look at um, teaching environments, what I mentioned before. Of course, we have to adjust to these things, right? We don't want to torture students. But I think motivation has to come at, at a certain age, a certain level, has to come from within, to be very honest. Uh, I, I, you want one more comment on this before I move on to my next question? Please. I, I do agree. I, I wish that that would be you know, as simple as what uh, Prof. Max Luther mentioned. But uh, it seems to me that it really depends on the student themselves. I do, on many occasions, because as I mentioned, UCSI, IMAS, Institute of Music, is a very performance oriented school. And unlike, the, of course, the applied lessons is, you know, they have to do well and, and they love applied lessons. They love music theory because they see the applicability of what they learn. Music history, some students just do not make the connection. Not that there's none, but there are many. So I feel that as musicology, our job is to make it relevant. Like, I, I, in that sense, yeah. And then once you get that hook, yeah, as performers, they start to see the relevance. <laughs> I also wanted to add to, to Marx, there's a huge difference between they should have their own motivation to pass an exam or whether they have the motivation to absolutely really excel, excel in a subject or to dive deeper on their own, right? That's a big difference. Well, I mean, that's a huge difference. And we know these students who, who need an extra motivation to pass an exam and once they graduate and are open, let's talk about performers, the market, they might not go quite far. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I, I, absolutely. If I, from all your uh, fantastic presentations, I, I made some notes and I and I couldn't help but observing. We are talking very much about what is better being taught online and what is better being taught directly, right? And we have uh, getting quite a picture now that there are some things that are can be without any uh, problem taught online. Some say even better or one can introduce the online uh, uh, experience that would, even in the direct uh, lesson. And there are some things uh, that really need a person directly with one in the room, especially if it comes to music, if it comes to personal expression and feeling yourself comfortable in the physicality and also the sound sphere. Uh, but there is a, actually a second tension field that I noticed that is the one between prefab, prefabricated uh, knowledge what you can have and the real individual catering to a student with the student having special need in uh, everybody learns differently everybody has different things that uh, drive them forward and this actually clearly creates a quite a cross field um, and i see with the online teaching also a lot of more prefab um, uh, content uh, which used to be when I was a student, that was before the internet time, uh, just the script of your teacher and the recordings that are out there. But now it's, it's, it's of course, way more. And, uh, and that leads now to, to uh, my question is we can create, create a lot of knowledge uh, online and we can find a lot of knowledge online. And students can find a lot of knowledge online. Uh, what is the reason left to listen to us and not to somebody else? And we know that individual lesson uh, is extremely important for a student to develop, even especially in a young age, because at a young age, uh, they are way more in need of this interpersonal contact and an adult to, to gain their knowledge. And they draw a lot of, of a person in the room that is just from learning psychology known. And how we can we tell than the shareholders, which is governments who want us to move more online or economic pressures like no space available and so on. And also parents who say, I don't want to drive my, uh, my kids to music school or 
or, or, or students even who are older is that if I can do it from home, why should I go there personally, right? Uh, how can we, how can we uh, negotiate uh, all these things? So I would love to hear your thoughts. I know it's a can of worms, a never ending question, but there's a lot of questions there where I would really, um, you're halfway in. Maybe we start with Dr. Pam and Pan. Yeah, for, to me, I think we can bring a benefit of um, like a digital tools combined with in-person class also. I mean, if we can choose about um, all benefit for both, then yeah, we, we can mix that and, you know, like a develop our teaching in the future. But to me, but I still prefer to teach in person. I mean, it, especially for performance class, you know, for, for lecture, maybe it's possible. Maybe we have to think about, okay, what, what is the benefit? What is the best benefit for um, student or kids? Like um, if, if it's even helpful for them, I mean, for some lecture, is it possible to, is it possible to, you know, do online? If it's yes, maybe, yeah, why not in the future? But for the performance, I mean, if we can um, point about the benefit of, you know, to communicate with um, other players or uh, the colleague, like uh, in the press, what, 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 what they can gain from that, I think um, they, they can understand. And also I think for, um, like you mentioned at the very beginning about the, the online teaching, I think um, we have to have a good quality for that and very, you know, good content and very, um, have a good point, what, what you want to give it to the listener, not, not just like a do it because of you have to do, but if you have a point that, okay, I'm going to do this because what, what is, you know, um, others going to get from your teaching? I think this is a good point and we, yeah, we, we yeah, but I still prefer in person though. <laughs> uh, but yes, um, for me, I think that in order to convince parents that, okay, even though we can shift to online, but we still need in-person class. Well, I'll say that um, because I face many cases, um, many customers, and each of them has different learning styles. So it's the teacher's uh, job who can detect the student's um, characteristic and learning style and then adapt the teaching method that would uh, fit to the students and that in-person environment would help most. Um, however, I won't say that I prefer, I think the combination would be best. Well, because to me as an economist as well, so it actually reduces cost, it saves time, and the technology actually benefits. So. I think the combination and trying to find a way to use them all together would be, would be great. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Superpon. Yes. Um, in the future, we don't know yet um, about that, um, which one it should be the best platform, real or virtual, because of depending on the context at that time. Or might be the another fifth year or 10 year, we have the another wireless. So we have to do the social distancing is once again. So it's mean that, um, um, yeah. But for, for me, I'm a musician, so I prefer to hear the music at real. Uh, but nowadays, the because of the the technology has been developed a lot. So now online music or the music in the real venue is should be have the same thing. The same idea is um, the quality of those music. So for the teaching class, um, I, I totally understand about the, who a major teacher. So it means that to have to contact the people in person, it would be great, of course, to hear um, the uh, harmonic thing. So and everything, so we can um, know how to, you know, in e e every um, the performance skill, of course. But um, Right now, I think um, the collaborations between online or offline, so it's still the same. Um, we, we can merge and we can, we we'll say once again, we should have the, um, the flexibility to work on our music that we love. Mm, I see for myself also in the, teach, in the teaching, different age groups, certain, certain people just uh, have a huge motivating factor in doing something also for the teacher. 
uh, it's especially in the instrumental teaching. So they are not so one of the driving factors is also because they want to show how they improved to the teacher rather than the piece that they might find boring currently. Um, and others have uh, a big motivation from themselves. So there's definitely also uh, a big issue. Max, what do you want to add in there? Um, yeah, it's, it's very, Christoph, you mentioned before, like how can we, you know, now that governments want to shift things more towards online. I mean, this is what I read actually just in the preparation for this talk that many sources say, oh, online, you know, online education is much cheaper. I mean, it's like, I don't know where to begin. My hair got gray when I hear that. Um, because we should not we should not choose something in education, especially because it's cheaper. That's the only reason. That's dangerous. Um, when I when I published this this introduction video in April, I got a lot of criticism by colleagues saying, "Wow, you're promoting um, online teaching. You're you're cutting off our job." I think it's completely the opposite. Um, I still I'm very much looking forward to go back into a classroom, teach face to face because of the limitations that online learning, online teaching has. But I think, for example, projects like, like Atan Tupabon's pro community projects, and there's so many things like that. We have to convince governments to s that they understand limitations are, are not so easy to overcome in this context. And um, I don't know, it might be an interesting field, maybe working with psychologists and so on, um, so that we can sort of, uh, how to say, like, like support um, our thoughts by saying or, or saying that we need this the classroom setting. We cannot shift everything to online. There's too much that goes missing if we only do this. I think for me, in, the interesting thing is how can we include online teaching so we can benefit from the from the advantages of it and not just using it as a replacement. It's not a compromise. That's right. <laughs> I, I agree. I agree. <laughs> Dr. Chuck. I totally agree. Um, <laughs> I think for my case, in terms of the way content is delivered, I would say that I, I can see how this would work online, but yet at the same time, I would prefer a mixed mode kind of teaching because there is still some element of interaction that you need in a classroom that could not be replicated directly online. Having said that, um, I, I find teaching online in Zoom uh, uh, serving the purposes and, and the given the benefits that you know we have been describing in our paper so in terms of history in terms of delivering content um there's really not too much difference in, in comparison with you know practical uh, uh instrumental one-to-one -one learning as such that's my opinion Dr. Leung? perhaps uh, i want to address the, the earlier parts of what you mentioned about so many information nowadays you can find online do we still need music teachers in the sense, at least from a musicologist's point of view, we have started to shift away from very important knowledge, but rather being more facilitators in the sense. In the class, as much as we are teachers sharing knowledge with students, uh, don't forget that students themselves are also generate, generators of knowledge. They are capable of doing that if we create an, a, a, a conducive environment to encourage them to think more critically of the facts right, of music and how they can help to contribute to the current knowledge and scholarship and advance it further. Right? This is the whole point of uh, in part that why music history is relevant in a sense. It's not something that is frozen in time. We think of history as something that's frozen in time, but something that they have a part to play through research and engagements to contribute to current knowledge, filling in research gaps, thinking of new ways to think about music history, right? And advancing it forward. And, and, and suddenly music history is, the word history is not the past. I have to think of music history as the current in the future, uh, as part of a holistic uh, curriculum. Um, not anything less compared to applied lessons or theory, but as a whole in that sense, yeah. So in that sense, yes, uh, not to think about our students purely as receiver of knowledge, but also as generator of knowledge as well. Mm -hmm. I I, that leads also also for the what I find an interesting point is because it leads also to a maybe more global outreach and a more global development of method, methodologies and 
and possibility for students to access all this and basically even attend a class of a university that is as we see now is thousands of kilometers away or even a music school that is thousands of kilometers away um, and and with with providing this on uh, uh, this content and co providing it uh, well uh, we might uh, there's a possibility of a, of a big market concentration like if you have this prefab with just a bit of, of private teaching in there, then of course, uh, institution like Yamaha Music Schools is in, in a huge advantage because they have just the resources and, 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 and the background. Also, I'm also amazed that, that ABRSM is not coming out with uh, uh, putting their um, content online as, as great global things. Do you see a, a problem with us um, through this way of different schools of thinking might be drowned out uh, different uh, schools of musical expression might be drowned out during this chapter do you see a problem there anyone who wants to weigh in max is of course raising his hand i know you have an opinion about this please right, yeah of course um, <laughs> all right i mean i i i I mean, maybe some thoughts of school might dry out. That's probably a, a natural process that would happen sooner or later, even without online. But of course, this is sort of, uh, um, how to say this, um, accelerates this process, of course. I think what's, um, what's a bit dangerous, if we as music educators, um, if, if, we, if we are too close with certain, with certain companies, with certain, um, Producers. I mean, when you say Yamaha School, nothing wrong with their pro, uh, with mm -hmm. their programs or ABRSM. There's nothing wrong with that. It's just we we have to watch out that we still maybe keep a little distance um, so that we still see this is content that I need for my class. And it's not I'll do it because I have some advantages through that and so on. This is maybe we cannot cannot avoid this in the end. But I think this is one way one one of the responsibilities we have, as music educators have to keep a little distance and really judge the content and not um, using certain material for other reasons, if that makes mm -hmm. sense. Absolutely. Anyone else who wants to add on? Well, it's, it's time to wrap up. I, the disadvantage of an online symposium is uh, we don't, don't have the chance to go to di for dinner together and, <laughs> and start really discussing. Uh, um, I'm sure we all agree that a lot of this online lessons that we've learned and online content uh, is here to stay and will stay in uh, in the new normal. Um, we all hope and we know that certain things cannot re be replaced by our on, on online lessons. It's just a little duo that you play with your teacher and uh, or, uh, or similar things. Uh, because music is communication and I think a lot of people, even non-musicians, have learned during this crisis now that some communications you can just have when you're in the same room with each, with each other. And that is it's the same for performance, it's the same for, for teaching, I, I feel. And also a lot of communication happens unplanned at the site and by the way. And the online, online communication might not always facilitate that as well. I thank you all very much for for taking your time to join us uh, this afternoon. Uh, hope to hear a lot of more of you and more discussions, and maybe we see each other having more of this discussion soon. And um, for everybody who was uh, listening in, do check out all the other events that the symposium is still having on for the rest of the week. Thank you very much, and I wish you a great evening ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye.